Thank you for joining us. We are honoring two Baylor legends today, and we're grateful that you've made time to be with us. This is a time to honor the bravery, the sacrifice, and the service of two Baylor alumni, United States Army Air Corps Colonel John Raleigh Kane and United States Marine Corps First Lieutenant Andrew Jackson, Jack Loomis, Jr. Baylor's two Medal of Honor recipients. We want to honor their service and their legacies today, but before we begin our program, we think it's only appropriate to start our time together in prayer. Will you please pray with me now? God, we come to you in a spirit of thanksgiving, thanking you for this day, for this opportunity to honor two of our great Baylor alumni. But first, Father, we thank you for Baylor University. We thank you for the spirit that exists here at this university, the spirit of Christian of the Christian mission. Father, we thank you for brave men like John Kane and Jack Loomis for giving their lives for this country. And Lord, Lord we, we know that that type of sacrifice is important because you gave your son for us. Thank you, Father. We ask that this program be a success. We ask that those who are here today, their lives be blessed. Keep everyone safe, for in Jesus' name we pray, amen. There were 464 Medal of Honors um, awarded in World War II, and there were over 16 million servicemen and women. So if you think about it, your, your act to win a Medal of Honor immortalized you, just like you immortalized the Greeks at Marathon or Thermopylae or uh, our soldiers during the Civil War. This immortalized those, those men forever. And so to me, having two Congressional Medal of Honor winners who are also Letterman at Baylor sets Baylor apart. And that allows us to be able to tell the story of these men, their heroism, what they gave for their country and how they led their men. That also sinks into Baylor's mission, which is, it's not about educating, not just about educating, it's also about leadership and service and duty and also to be willing to sacrifice your life, you have to you have to have faith. You know, faith in God, faith in your fellow man, faith in humanity. And so faith is a central element, in my view, of these men, and also it's a central element to Baylor's mission. And so to me, educating this generation and subsequent generations about the sacrifices that were made, the heroism of these men, you want that to translate as much as you can to this generation so that they understand those sacrifices, the heroism, but also so that they can walk away from it thinking about the central elements that Baylor tries to imbue on them, which is leadership, service, duty, and also, um, yeah, and faith. When, when uh, John Kane and Jack Loomis were walking Baylor's campus, they had those elements in them. I think we have a current generation of Baylor students that have those elements within them. While they may not be called to do something as harrowing as what Kane and Loomis 
uh, were called to do in their everyday lives, they can live these, these virtues out. And maybe this will make them think about the virtues that were um, embedded in, in Cain and Loomis. And, and again, to be inspired by them, but in today's world. He was born in McGregor. He's the son of a preacher. He went to Baylor and played football and basketball, and he was on the fatal bus ride that gave rise to the 10 deaths that led to the Immortal 10 legacy at Baylor. So in addition to being a war hero, he also features in another prominent part of Baylor history, along with his father being a preacher. So he grew up in Texas, went to Baylor, played basketball and football, and then he enlisted in the Air Force. And so he was a career mil military man, unlike Loomis. And so he was already a mature squadron leader when he led his uh, iconic mission to bomb Ploesti, flying at low altitude over the Mediterranean, across mountainous Greece, and then into Romania, which is where Hitler's main refineries were that fueled the, the, the Nazis. So as they were flying at low altitude over the Mediterranean to evade Hitler's radar system once you got into Europe. And they got detached from the main group. The element of surprise had been lost because the main group had already bombed Ploesti. Instead of turning back, he forged on and fulfilled his mission even though they'd already bombed Ploesti. Flames were shooting up in the sky up to his aircraft. You had any aircraft guns shooting at him. They'd already scrambled fighters and so he fulfilled his mission along with his men. So again, risking his life again, he circled Pluesti to allow the rest of the planes to fall in behind him to fly out. And he crash landed in Cyprus because he didn't have enough fuel to get back to North Africa. And for that, he won the Congressional Medal of Honor. So just an iconic story, an iconic man and one of great leadership, and his nickname was Killer Kane. And he didn't particularly like the nickname. He was named that by German intelligence because of his daring. Um, but his men loved him. He was kind of a gruff guy, but his men loved him, and they'd follow him through the gates of hell, and indeed they did. I, I think the thing that resonated with me being from Central Texas is both these men are from Central Texas. So Jack Loomis, grew up on a farm in Ennis, Texas, which is about 75 miles northeast of Waco. And so if you look at Baylor during that era before, it drew kids from Central Texas. It wasn't this global institution that we see today. It really drew kids from Central Texas who are looking for an opportunity to better themselves. And so in, in Jack's case, he grew up on a farm in the middle of the Depression. So his family hit hard times, but he still managed to be a two, a two sports star in, in his high school. And then he enrolled at Baylor and became a two sport All-American, which is very rare. He was an All-American in for Baylor football team. He was also an All-American baseball player. And some say that he was a much better baseball player than he was football player. So when he graduated from Baylor, he played pro baseball for a time before he uh, began to play for the New York Giants. And so his career was only one season, but he played for the Giants in 1941. And so in one of their final games at the Polo Grounds, it was on December 7th. So they got word that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor and the bombing was going on as they were playing. So they were informed after the game and so they finished out the seasons. Giants had a great season and they played for the NFL championship. But then Jack immediately enlisted in the Marines because he felt called to service. And so if you look at his life, it was much shorter. He was ultimately uh, deployed to the Pacific. And so one of our great battles towards the end of the Pacific War against the Japanese was Iwo Jima, which was an important island southeast of the main island that was an important launching ground for a potential invasion of Japan and it was fiercely fortified by the Japanese and it's a volcanic island so very rough terrain and so Jack was one of the first waves ashore with his men and then he was at the base of Mount Suribachi 
So again, this notion of service and leadership, he was leading his men. He was tasked with an almost impossible objective, which is to take out fortified position at the base of Mount Suribachi. Rather than leading his men to do that, he launched a one-man attack against fortified Japanese positions at the base of the mountain. So he launched himself. He was hit by a grenade and wounded but he forged forward and took out one Japanese pillbox and then a second before going back to his men. So think about this, this is the leader of the platoon and a very different person than, than John Kane, a quieter, perhaps a more laconic person, but a leader nonetheless. So he went back, got his men, and then led them and they were behind him and he was hit by another grenade before taking out the third Japanese pillbox. After he did that, he hit a landmine that blew off his legs. And so his men rallied around him, but instead of him asking for their help, he exhorted them forward. So they wanted to sit or they wanted to fall back and help him, but he exhorted them forward. So with tears in their eyes, they forged forward to accomplish their mission. He was ultimately taken back to the Army Hospital at the, uh, at the base of Mount Suribachi. It shows you what type of person he was, just, uh, again, a, a very stoic but, but graceful human being. And as he lay dying, his last words were, were, well, Doc, it looks like the New York Giants lost a mighty fine end today. And those were his last words. The great thing about sports is there are different types of leaders. And I think you can definitely see in both of these men the different types of leaders that they were, which is number one, Kane is a very confident, you know, maybe not brusque, but confident. You can see where he might be a, a more vocal part of the clubhouse in leading his men whether it's playing football or basketball, or leading his men in war. And if you look at Loomis, he seems to be more the silent leader, lead by example. But both these are very powerful leadership styles that allowed them to lead their men, in, in their case, lead their men safely um, in battle. My hope is that this is a gathering spot where people, again, can time and time again read the story about the heroism of these men and their stories, which are very different. I mean, they're very different men and very striking, very different poses, both strong leaders, but lead, they led in different ways. The, the confidence of, of Cain, chest forward, addressing his men, and then a more laconic, graceful, tall, um, Loomis, who's striking the pose of David before he goes off into battle against Goliath. In, in Loomis's case, sh with his uh, rifle over his shoulder as he's looking towards um, the one-man assault that he'd ultimately launch. And so those resonate, and I think they'll resonate with people who look at them time and time again, who'll catch a different element of the statues as they look on them time and time again. So to be a high traffic area that was important, located where Baylor fans and also visitors alike can admire them. To me, it's, it's our Baylor family it is the best of our Baylor family. It represents the best in us, what these men did. And so that's something as hosts, when people come into our family, to our stadium to visit, even though we're trying to win a football game, we can tell that story about the Baylor family and what these men did. And, and their ideals, but it also binds us together with the rest, with, with our visitors, which is, this is not just Baylor history, this is American history. This is fundamental to our country. So this is the best way, in my opinion, to showcase the Baylor family, our ideals, to those who we are hosting, but more importantly, where they can walk away from our campus and feel good about the visit, the Baylor community, and also about our country. So those to me were the important facets to the genesis of this project.
And welcome as we continue on our virtual lunch with a legend on this Veterans Day 2020. My name is John Morris. Let me introduce you to our two special guests who will continue the conversation about these two Congressional Medal of Honor winners from Baylor University. To my left and your right is a man that really needs no introduction. Brad Livingstone is the first gent at Baylor University. Also with relation to this discussion, Brad, you have taught for 30 years uh, history uh, now at Vanguard College Preparatory here in Waco. So we're going to dive deep into uh, your knowledge of history and especially World War II history. You have an emphasis, don't you, in World War II history? That's correct, yes. That's a real passion of mine as far as a teaching area. Great. So we're going to draw on you for that. To my right, to your left, is uh, our good friend Alan Lefevre. Alan is the executive director of the Texas Baptist Historical Collection. He's also an adjunct professor at Truett, uh, Truett Seminary. And uh, this is the guy that literally wrote the book on Baylor Athletics, the history of Baylor Athletics. So Alan, I know you are very well versed in our subject matter today. Yes. Great to have you here. Thank you. Brad, let me start with you. Uh, for those of us who may not be uh, it, it, it may not be that knowledgeable uh, b from a military uh, perspective on the Congressional Medal of Honor, the significance of that. Kind of give us some context on the significance of the Congressional Medal of Honor. Sure, John. Um, I've, I've had the opportunity to actually meet one, one individual uh, that, that received the Congressional Medal of Honor or the Medal of Honor, uh, and, and he was in my classroom. And it was here in, uh, oh, excuse me, it was, it was in California when I was teaching. And uh, I introduced him, and this is when I found never introduce somebody like this. I introduced, his name was Walt Ehlers, and I introduced him as a winner of the Congressional Medal of Honor. And he was very nice, but he corrected me, and he said, young man, which I really appreciate him calling nice, me. Nice, right? Uh, you don't win the Medal of Honor, you receive it. And in many cases, You've, you don't really feel you've even earned it. And that's, that was a lesson to me. So from that point on, any uh, recipient of any medal in the military, uh, they receive it. Uh, they didn't win it. So uh, it's, it's an amazing, it's the highest award. A lot of people call it the Congressional Medal of Honor. It is, it is presented by the president, but it's approved by Congress, but its official name is Medal of Honor. Hmm. And, um, and there, were, there, there weren't that many. There were 16 million men and women that served in World War II alone, and very few individuals received. In fact, I, I crunched the numbers. Uh, you had a 0.003% chance of receiving the, the, the Medal of Honor wow. during World War II. So, um, so it, it, it's a very prestigious honor. There is no higher honor. I met another recipient of the Medal of Honor uh, when I was teaching in the Washington, D.C. area a few years ago. And I did not know this, that uh, you could be a private first class if you've received the, the Medal of Honor uh, and you walk by a general and you're wearing that Medal of Honor, they salute you. Oh, wow. Even if you're a private. Mm. Uh, it's, it's as prestigious as it gets in the military. Okay, so given how distinguished that is, how rare is it for Baylor University, not a military institution, but for Baylor University to have two Medal of Honor winners from our school? Well, and, and, and regardless if it's a military institution or not, to have two individuals receive it is, is incredible percentage-wise, uh, given the numbers that we talked about earlier. But to have Baylor University have two recipients of the Medal of Honor is extraordinary. And then when you go into their particular stories and, and, and how they uh, earned it and then received it with grace is, is incredibly remarkable. Alan, let's dive into those stories, the histories of these two guys, uh, John Kane and Jack <coughs> Loomis, come from very different backgrounds. Tell us how they ended up, both those guys ended up at Baylor. Well, it, it's a very interesting story. John Kane's story could be like many Baylor students today. His dad was actually a Baylor graduate, had both a bachelor's and master's from Baylor, and was a prominent Southern Baptist preacher. And so he basically was probably, like many Baylor alum, he was probably predestined to attend Baylor. Whereas uh, Jack Loomis, he his family was struggling during the Depression when uh, he'd actually dropped out of high school and had gone to a a military college for a couple of years 
and had been scouted by Tulane, was basically going to head to Tulane until he got an offer to come to Baylor and came to the campus. And uh, so one a very normal course with, with uh, Loomis, it was, I think he got the offer, saw the campus and wanted to come, but his family really struggled during the depression. So it was a, basically a gift that he was able to be at Baylor. Hmm. Uh, you mentioned both these guys are letter winners, athletic letter winners here at Baylor. We're very proud of that fact. But uh, tell us about their, their career, uh, what their careers looked like here at Baylor, and for uh, Loomis, what it looked like beyond Baylor. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, John Kane didn't have a standout athletic career. He was, a, he was, in many ways, a good athlete, not a great one. He played basketball for three years here at Baylor, football for one. Uh, and but he seemed to enjoy all the aspects of being uh, part of the college life. Whereas uh, Jack Loomis, he was a gifted athlete. In fact, Lloyd Russell will say four years later that there was no better center fielder that he had seen hmm. than Jack Loomis. Uh, but he was also a gifted football player. A played end was a, and he was built as an athlete, 6'3", 200 pounds. Uh, Russell would talk about how fluid he was. And uh, his senior year, he he dropped out of Baylor, actually, with 25 other students to sign up for, for training in the Army Air Corps. Uh, didn't finish school. His grades were fine. But it was like he was ready to get on with the next step of his life. And it was after that that the Giants, the New York Giants, drafted him uh, to play for them. And uh, after he washed out of the Air Corps, he decided to give the Giants a try. And back then, the rosters for NFL teams only had 33 players on them. So most players played both ways, and he certainly did as a, as a defensive lineman and then as a, an end, a tight end that we would say today. And, uh, and he had a good, not an outstanding first year, as you wouldn't expect a young rookie to have, but they saw great promise in him. And uh, then when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor soon after that in January of 1942, he signed up for the Marines and was ready to go. Hmm. What was it so when World War II broke out, uh, like so many young men that age in that era, uh, they signed up. They enlisted. What was it that uh, really possessed these two guys to enlist at that time? Well, it, with Jack Loomis, it was a direct tie to, to getting in the war. Kane had actually been a career military man. He, he wanted to go to med school after Baylor, but he couldn't stand the smell involved <laughs> with medicine. And so he went home for a while, worked on his grandfather's ranch, then, uh, then signed up for the military. And from 31 and 31 he started to train as a pilot in 34 he was discharged and went back he sold some homes literally dug some ditches you know if you wonder what a Baylor degree will do for you sometimes <laughs> and uh, but then he uh, he was called up for the military in 35 so when World War II broke out he had already been back in the service for six years t well trained as a pilot and ready to step up Another part of uh, John Kane's Baylor legacy is he was a member of the Immortal Ten. I mean, as if what he had done militarily was not enough. He was a member of the Immortal Ten basketball team. You know, the tragic uh, railroad uh, bus crash in Round Rock, January of 1927. Uh, how did that shape? He, he obviously was one who survived the crash, but how did that shape his future from that point forward? I think it dr drastically colored the rest of his life. And, you know, when you delve into who John Kane was afterwards. Uh, he, his senior year, he didn't play sports. He got involved in theater at Baylor. He was in, in chamber. He was in the pre-med club. Uh, the tragedy that night and what he must have seen and the friends that he lost, I think, altered the rest of his life. Some of the people who served with him in the service said that he was cold and apart from them. One of them said that uh, uh, they asked him, he said, I'm not here to be your mother, I'm here to save your life. And I think he, I really wonder if that experience with being on that bus, seeing that tragedy made him detach a little bit. And then there's the fact that the missions that he did, you know, and, and, and even the mission where he won the Medal of Honor, I mean, these are, this was a great risk to his life. And it almost seems to me like that experience may have emboldened him to realize he had this higher calling, and he did it uh, throughout his military career. He just he stepped up 
Uh, so yeah, I think I think had he not, I wonder as a historian, and Brad, you probably think about this too, as as a historian, what if, what would he have been like had he not been through that tragedy? How would that have colored who he was? Because I think it had a great impact on on exactly what he became. Yeah, Brad, any thoughts on that? Well, and and, and I absolutely agree with that, Alan. The uh, you know the the events that take place in our lives help shape our futures. And uh, I have no doubt that that had something to do with it. That was such an, uh, uh, an incredible event that he survived. Um, and, and, I've, and I've talked to so many veterans that have gone through uh, death-defying experiences where they feel like, number one, they feel like they've been given a, uh, a lease on life again that they can do some extraordinary things. And, uh, and I have no doubt that, that that played in his his mind on that during World War II. Sounds like uh, death-defying sometimes is life-defining, and maybe that was the case with, uh, with him. Without a doubt, yeah. without a doubt. And his story is absolutely amazing in the sense of uh, what he was able to experience uh, during World War II. Brad, historically, John Cain served in the European theater, uh, Jack Loomis in the Pacific theater. Yes. Give us, give us a sense of what the differences were, what were those guys, what was the difference in the wars that they were involved in by those locations? Well, and uh, the locations themselves, as far as uh, you, you have the whole gamut. In the Pacific theater, depending if you fought in the northern part of the Pacific theater, that can be a, a little bit colder and cooler, or in the South Pacific, which is a lot more humid and hot. Uh, of course, uh, Jack Lu Loomis, uh, Lieutenant Loomis, he uh, fought in Iwo Jima. And uh, Iwo Jima is considered one of the um, bloodiest battlefields in the history of the United States. And uh, it was one of the few places that actually had more uh, U.S. casualties than Japanese casualties. And, uh, and, I've, and I've had an opportunity to visit with a number of individuals who survived um, uh, the, the Battle of Iwo Jima. Of course, uh, Lieutenant Loomis did not. But his story on how he was able to uh, carry his men forward in being able to uh, secure that island, which, which literally saved uh, hundreds of others uh, that were fighting behind him. Uh, of course, he lost his life in that, in that battle too, but just a horrendous battlefield on both sides both the, the Americans and the Japanese. The Japanese were actually told, you're going to die. But before you die, you need to kill at least 10 Americans. And so they knew that, they knew that this was, the, the Japanese knew this is their last battle. Uh, and the Americans had to fight through that determination. Uh, and it lasted, the Battle of Iwo Jima lasted for more than a month. Uh, and and, and in, that, in that particular month, extraordinary uh, uh, acts of uh, heroism. And of course, uh, uh, Lieutenant Loomis is numbered among them. Well, these men lived and in uh, Jack Loomis's case died more than 80 years ago. What, what is the value in preserving their story, the history, what they went through with these monuments? Uh, what, what is the value that we can gain from that? Well, I think, I think one of the, the, the most important is that we don't forget. Um, we, we, we live in a time in the United States where we feel, you know, there's, there are certain things that are happening that, that seem very um, uh, problematic. But when you go back and you look at what people have been able to go through uh, and, and, and succeed and, and really help uh, form the country that we, we enjoy today, um, there's, there's, it's very important for us to appreciate that. And, and there are so many stories today. Um, we, we hear about some of the more famous individuals, but like I, uh, like I mentioned before, over 16 million Americans, men and women, served in World War II, or, or even more so in the military, and most of their stories no one knows. Uh, and it's so important to capture those stories and be able to pre present to the younger generations. This is what, and this is why I love teaching at the high school level, because a lot of these veterans were my high school uh, students ages when they were doing these incredible mm -hmm. events. And, and you know, high school students and myself included, and I'm sure the rest of us, when we were seniors in high school, we were worried about what car are we gonna drive? What, you know, who are we gonna take out uh, on a date uh, for the weekend? They were fighting for survival. 
uh, in faraway places, uh, Pulaski Airfields, uh, Iwo Jima, uh, like both of our, our veterans here. So it's really important to be able to capture their stories and be able to present it to others so we can appreciate the freedoms that we, that we enjoy here in the United States today. Alan, uh, as Brad said, you know, high school students, that was the age of these guys, college students, their age, pretty much the same. How can our students here uh, appreciate and understand, uh, can just learn to appreciate the stories of John Kane and, uh, and also Jack Loomis? I think that <clears throat> it goes in line with the, even the light poles we have around the campus that, that are to people who have, in many cases, given their lives in, in defense of the country. And that is that there are great things that each of us can do. A lot of times we read these stories and we think, oh, well, that was an extraordinary person. Well, that wasn't an extraordinary person until they had to be. Mm -hmm. and, and both Loomis and Cain, when, when they needed to step up, they did. And I, and I hope as students walk by, they realize that they have that same power inside them that in, in any crisis situation, they can step up and meet the demands of the moment. As we mentioned, these statues will be located uh, along the Bear Walk where the Baylor football team comes into the stadium. They'll walk right beside these statues of these uh, larger than life former football student athletes and Medal of Honor winners. What is the benefit you see there for student athletes, you know, being able to cross right in front of the path of those statues? Man, if you can't get inspired as an athlete <laughs> walking in front of those guys, I don't know what else can inspire you. I mean, the, to just remind them that what they're doing on any given Saturday is a game and that there's so much out in front of them. Even though Loomis's life was short, I mean, what an amazing life he had. And Cain, he lived a long time and, and, and helped literally, both men saved countless lives because of their actions. I think it's a reminder that, to athletes that this chapter of their life may be short, but there's so many other great things they can do. Maybe when no one sees, or no one is certainly there to cheer, but they can make an impact on the world, regardless of the crowd. Sound like a pregame pep speech, right? There. <laughs> In the making, for sure. I can see that. I'm coming. ready to go play. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well done, Alan. Uh, there, there is that tie, Brad, between uh, you know what these guys did in the military, Medal of Honor winners, but also mm -hmm. student athletes, and that could be. I mean, that could be awe inspiring to current student athletes, without a doubt. And not not only current student athletes, but current students in general. Anyone that walks by, and I'm sure that there'll be many individuals that will walk by that will be inquisitive. Who is this person? Um, you know, when we walk by uh, RG3, everybody knows who RG3 <laughs> is. Uh, but who are these individuals? And then allow uh, students, student athletes, or just alumni to, to dig a little bit deeper to find out why, why are we honoring these two individuals? They're incredibly special people, but I love what Alan said is that uh, they're really ordinary individuals that did extraordinary things when they were called upon. And, uh, and that's inspiring, very inspiring for all of us. So these two statues here on, uh, on this side of the interstate, just on the other side of the interstate, just up MLK Boulevard, is the uh, great tribute to Doris Miller. And uh, Dory Miller, I know you probably talked about him a lot in your classes through the years. What a tremendous uh, uh, memorial that is to him and a tremendous marker and, and motivating factor for all of us who live here in Waco in Central Texas. Exactly right. And I drive by that memorial twice a day on my way from Baylor to Vanguard. Uh, and uh, I'm so thankful that it's there. I'm so thankful that it was dedicated. The story of Dory Miller is extraordinary. And again, an individual that not only um, uh, did an extraordinary thing at Pearl Harbor, uh, he served upon, uh, he served on the USS West Virginia. And when the Japanese attacked us at Pearl Harbor, um, he went above and beyond his own personal training and uh, saved, saved a number of people's lives, but also was able to mount a, um, a 20 millimeter um, uh, a cannon and, uh, and shoot down a number of Japanese warplanes, never having ever trained on that particular anti-aircraft gun. 
Um, and 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 that for somebody to to recognize that one of the things that that has to happen in order for somebody to receive the Medal of Honor is that you have to have at least two live witnesses from for what you're doing. And many individuals that did, w w did extraordinary things, there was no one that either survived that witnessed that, um, or there weren't that many people around, and they did that on their own. So. Some individuals, even though they did extraordinary things that probably deserve the Medal of Honor, they, they couldn't receive it because there weren't eyewitnesses to that particular event that survived the, the event. And so with Doris Miller, obviously there, there were because he wasn't going anywhere. There were people watching that. And uh, for him to be able to not only do that extraordinary thing on, at, at Pearl Harbor, but then to break through the color barrier that existed in all of the United States military. We were a segregated military throughout World War II. He was the very first African-American to receive the Navy Cross. Uh, people, some people thought he should and still think that he should have received the uh, Medal of Honor. Uh, and there's still a push for that. Um, but to, to know that we have one uh, who grew up here in Waco, uh, was a boxing champion on the West Virginia, uh, Dr. Uh, Mike Parrish, has written an extraordinary book on Doris Miller, uh, talking about really that helped um, um, really push us into the modern day civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And to know that that individual grew up here in Waco, Texas, Doris Miller, uh, uh, should make us all very, very proud of where we live. Yeah. To close our part of the discussion today, this is Veterans Day, and isn't it uh, fitting that we can spend part of Veterans Day saluting these heroes like Doris Miller, like John Cain, like Jack Loomis. Exactly right. And, and, and literally the millions of others that served. And uh, one of the things, and we, we've had to downplay it during COVID, but one of the things that uh, I, I train my students, high school students, is that I'll load them up in the van and we'll go to, we'll, we'll go to Walmart or we'll go to HEB and I'll look at my watch and I said, you've got 10 minutes go find veterans and shake their hand and say, thank you for serving our country. And you see them just spread out and it, and they get so excited about being able to say thank you. But what the veterans, because they're not expecting it, these elderly men and in some cases, uh, women that wear the hats, it makes it very easy uh, going up and being thanked by uh, a young uh, man or a young woman. It, it absolutely uh, uh, astonishes them. And I think shatters a great stereotype, a negative stereotype that some some that served in the military that are older, they all they hear about are negative things many times about the younger generation. And it shatters that stereotype that that we've got some great, amazing young men and women that are very thankful for our veterans and will go out of their way to find them and say thank you and shake their hands. That's a great exercise. Mm -hmm. That's great. Alan, final thought. Uh, two great representatives of Baylor Athletics through the years here, but boy, so much even more beyond what they did here at Baylor. I think one thing I, I do want to point out for all of us as Baylor Bears remember is that there is no other uh, school, to my knowledge, outside of the military academies that have had two athletes that have won the Medal of Honor, except Baylor University. Wow, very good. Well, great to remember uh, these heroes, and as Brad said, so many millions of others on this Veterans Day, we, uh, we thank you uh, with most sincere uh, open hearts. We thank you and we appreciate your service to all of us and uh, hope you will, as Brad does with his students, maybe uh, next time you cross paths with a veteran, just say thank you to them in this way. Hi, my name is uh, Kevin Davis. I am the VETS program manager at Baylor University, and I have the blessing of getting to serve our uh, student veterans here at Baylor. We have uh, about 100 undergraduate student veterans with about 60 more uh, graduate that I have the blessing of serve to serve. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm super thankful to be a part of this event, recognizing uh, two great heroes of Baylor in uh, Jack Loomis and John Kane. Uh, I don't think anyone embodies our mission of worldwide leadership and service more than what uh, they have exhibited and the battlefields that they were a part of. And uh, not to mention, as you walk around Baylor's campus and uh, you're never gonna be too far from an outstretched lamppost or the shadow of an outstretched lamppost of one of our men and women who paid the ultimate sacrifice in military service. Um, 
it's uh, truly a blessing to get to be part of a university uh, that serves and that or that that f focuses on the mission of worldwide leadership and service and uh, and get to be specifically serving student veterans with that mission um, as I think it's a, a perfect segue into their next chapters of that same mission. Our student veterans bring a richness to our Baylor campus, uh, one through their global perspectives that they bring uh, from all corners of the world, uh, two through their profound leadership experience, and three for their genuine battle-tested hearts for service. Because Baylor really values these assets that our student veterans bring to our campus and classroom communities, uh, that's why the VETS program is here to support them. Some of the key losses that veterans can face after coming out of the military um, are that loss of structure, um, that loss of camaraderie and community, and sometimes also that loss of identity and purpose. And so when we have this rich history of, of servant leaders that we can see all across our campus and within our Baylor mission statement, uh, Baylor just becomes a perfect match for their transition out of the military and into their next chapters of worldwide leadership and service. And that's why we uh, aim our, work so hard at uh, supporting them in, in, their, uh, in their transition. Uh, thank you again for, for being here and being part of this celebration. Um, and thank you to all of our servants uh, all across Baylor. Second Bears.